Hello, and welcome to the League Women Voters of Marblehead program entitled Overlook Too Long, Women of Color and the Struggle for Suffrage. My name is Kathy Leonardson, and I'm a member of the Marblehead League. On the screen now is a list of the suffragists that we will be speaking about today. Our presenters are Kathy Marie Michael, Jody Howard, Kathy Hempel, Melissa Humphrey standing in for Lee Mondale, Catherine Redmond, Sherry Pressman, and myself, Kathy Leonardson. We're all members of the Marblehead League of Women Voters. I will begin with a statement honoring Native lands in tribute of Marblehead's first Indigenous Peoples Day. Kathy Marie Michael will then introduce a program on women of color and the struggle for suffrage. And presenters will proceed to share what they've learned about the various individual suffragists. Marblehead's first Indigenous Peoples Day took place on October 12, 2020. We will take a few moments to acknowledge the land we're on and its native people. It is an act of remembering. Each of us, no matter where we are, reside on native land. We offer recognition and respect to those people in this land to counter the doctrine of discovery, too often forgetting the true story of the people that were here already. Native Americans had no written language as we know it, and instead they passed along history and culture through oral stories from generation to generation. If you live in Marblehead, Massachusetts, as I do, you live on land of the Nomkeg tribe of the Pawtucka Confederation of New England that primarily extended throughout Essex County. The Nomkegs were nomadic. Spending warm seasons in Marblehead, they fished, clammed, and grew corn and squash. They collected salt from ocean shores to season and preserve their food. The Nomkegs were decimated by war and disease. In 1615 through 1619, and once again in 1633, a disease believed to be smallpox brought by traders and trappers from the outside killed 80 to 90% of the population, which had been several thousand. The last and best known Sockum or chief named Nanny Pashamit died in 1617. We have a street on the Marblehead Neck named after him. In 1680, excuse me, in 1684, Chief Nanny Pashamit's descendants sold 3,400 acres to the English settlers of Marblehead for 16 English pounds. The original deed hangs in Abbott Hall. Many artifacts from native life have been found in Marblehead from Nagas Head to Legs Hill to Weshaver. We honor those on the land before us by remembering their history. Native Americans were important contributors to the women's struggle for suffrage. Recall that life for the suffragists is dictated by the church and English common law meant that they could own no property. All money inherited or earned went to their husbands and children belonged to their husbands. However, in upstate New York where suffragists Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Melissa Joslyn Gage and Susan B. Anthony lived they encountered members of the Iroquois Confederacy consisting of six Native American nations. This was a society in which Iroquois women had the final authority over land transfer and engaging in war. Women controlled their own property, controlled their own bodies and their children. All decisions in the clan were made by consensus. Even the choice of chief was up to women. The model of rights in Iroquois culture inspired the suffragists, providing a tangible vision of democracy and equality. And for this, we honor and thank the Native Americans of upstate New York, the Iroquois Confederacy. Next, Kathy Marie Michael will introduce the program on women of color and the struggle for suffrage. We have come together today to acknowledge and to begin to heal our wounds. We, your presenters, both as individuals and as part of the League of Women Voters of Marblehead are willing to examine our individual and group complicity in furthering white supremacy. I myself have been examining my blindness as a white woman. We, the steering committee of the Marblehead League of Women Voters in conjunction with the US League have embarked upon a journey of educating ourselves in the black Native American and immigrant history that has been left out of our history books. 
and mainstream media, at least until recently. Today's webinar is the result of our desire to reach out first by educating and transforming ourselves and then each other. We learned that the history of the suffrage movement was written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony as they saw it through their eyes. They did not include how they strategized and acquiesced to white supremacy while selling out the interests of African-American women in order to further their own. They did not mention the many white-led suffrage groups who afforded no platform to black women. They did not name the many absolutely amazing women of color who fought for both equality and the vote for 200 years. Today, we will highlight seven of these women, not because they stood out from the others. Actually, there were so many to choose from. They were selected randomly and we have fallen in love with each. It is our hope that you do the same. Abandoned by the white suffrage movement, black women took charge of their own futures and self-organized. They formed clubs. These black clubs fought not only for the vote, but also for equality. They created schools for black students, formed professional training programs, established elder care, and provided medical resources where white hospitals refused to serve black patients. For 200 years, black women have linked attaining the ballot access with establishing human rights for all. Now in 2020, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment when women secured the vote. But we ask ourselves today, how do we celebrate when only one population, the white woman was allowed to vote? For black suffragists, the fight continued on. It took another 50 years during which Blacks endured the brutality and terror of Jim Crow laws until the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act for Black women and men to have their voting rights secured. Native Americans would not be considered citizens until the passage of the Snyder Act in 1924. But until 1962, individual states still prevented them from voting on contrived grounds, such as literacy tests, poll taxes, intimidation, and more. Chinese Americans were barred from the vote until repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1943, and then the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952. Puerto Rican women could not vote until a 1975 extension to the Voting Rights Act, which prohibited discrimination against those who relied heavily on languages other than English. After all this, in 2013, the Supreme Court set back voting rights once again in Shelby versus Holder. This Supreme Court decision highlighted the most forceful provisions of the 1965 Voting Rights Act and immediately opened the floodgates for states to once again suppress the vote. They targeted black and Latino neighborhoods by closing polling places in congested areas where they live, causing them to walk or drive for miles to the nearest polling location. States also instituted new voter ID laws, choosing IDs which people of color do not have and other restrictive measures. The long struggle for suffrage, which began for black women in the early 1800s, persists 200 years later. I'm sad to say to this day. We hope that our efforts will be part of healing our deep divide and the wounds and trauma that so many carry. I'd now like to introduce Jody Howard who will tell us about Mary Ann Shad Carey. Mary Ann Shad Carey was a teacher, a journalist, a lawyer, an abolitionist, a newspaper editor and publisher, a recruiter for the Union Army, a wife and mother, a suffragist, and a rabble rouser. She is thought to have been involved with John Brown and his plans to take over the arsenal at Harper's Ferry. In 1823 in Delaware, she was born to free black abolitionist parents, the eldest of 13 children. Her home was a refuge for fugitive slaves. When she was 10, her family moved to Pennsylvania because Delaware prohibited the education of black children. 
She completed her early education at a Quaker boarding school and at 16 began teaching in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New York City. At age 25, she replied to a plea from Frederick Douglass to his readers in his North Star newspaper to suggest what could be done to improve the lives of black people in America. She wrote, we have been holding conventions for years, whining over our difficulties and afflictions, passing resolutions on resolutions, but it does really seem that we have made but little progress. We should do more and talk less." Unquote. She was possibly the first African-American suffragist to form a suffrage association. After the Fugitive Slave Act was passed in 1850, she and her brother Isaac emigrated to Canada where she ran a racially integrated school and in 1853 published a plea for emigration or Notes of Canada West, encouraging free men and women to emigrate and detailing where black Americans should settle and what they could expect. At that time, their choices were stay in, stay in slavery, flee to Canada or colonize in Africa, which in Shad Carey's words was teeming with the breath of pestilence, a burning sun and fearful maladies, unquote. She published several pieces that advertised Canada as a safe haven for former slaves and free blacks. She was the first woman in North America to publish and edit a weekly newspaper on anti-slavery, temperance and general literature called the Provincial Freeman. A critic from a rival paper unhappy with her views wrote, <clears throat> quote, Miss Shad has said and written many things which we think will add nothing to her credit as a lead lady, unquote. She criticized abolitionists who did not fight for full equality, but only supported segregated schools and communities. And she denounced refugee associations that collected money for fugitive slaves, but ignored free blacks living in poverty. She was well known as an agitator and was on a list of rabble rousers, 20 women who made a difference. As examples, in her newspaper, she listed the unhealthy ingredients used in brewing beer. She also reported that well-meaning people had donated money to expand a manual labor school that turned out not to exist. She was threatened because of her articles exposing wrongdoings and was told that if she didn't stop publishing them, she would be killed. The next part of her life was taken up with marriage to Toronto, Toronto barber Thomas Carey and her children. Unfortunately, her second child was born after her husband died leaving her with their two children and three stepchildren. When the Civil War began in need of income, she returned to Amer <coughs> America, to Indiana, after being hired by a friend to recruit blacks from the North to fight for the Union Army. After the war, she moved to Washington, DC to teach again and enrolled in How Howard University's newly established law school, becoming the first black woman to do so. Because the DC legal code did not admit women to the bar, she had to wait 16 years to receive her law degree. The next year, Shad Carey and 63 other women tried unsuccessfully to vote in DC, but being a determined activist, she asked officials to sign affidavits testing that the women had tried to vote. However, their individual names weren't taken down. Later, she challenged the Judiciary Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives and won the right for herself to vote in a federal election. In 1876, Shad Carey wrote the National Women Suffrage Association on behalf of 94 black women, requesting that their names be added to the July 4th autograph book of the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence as signers of the Woman's Declaration of Sentiments which demanded the immediate enfranchisement of American women. Continuing her quest to gain votes for women and particularly black women, she spoke at the 1878 convention of the National Woman Suffrage Association of which she was a member. In her arguments advocating suffrage, she applied the principles of the 14th and 15th amendments to women as well as men. She called for an amendment to remove the word male from the constitution. And she publicly protested that the legal writing was not gender neutral. 
in the 1880s, she founded the short-lived Colored Women's Progressive Franchise Association. Until her death of stomach cancer in 1893, using her law degree, she helped family and friends with legal issues and worked for equal rights for black women and men. Her brick row house at 1421 West Street Northwest in DC is on the National Register of Historic Places and is a lasting reminder of one of the most outspoken and articulate female abolitionists of the 19th century. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote of Shad Carey 30 years after her death in an essay titled The Damnation of Women, quote, well-educated, vivacious, with determination shining from her sharp eyes, she threw herself single-handed into the great Canadian pilgrimage when thousands of hunted black men hurried northward and crept beneath the protection of the lion's paw, unquote. Next, uh, Kathy Hempel will speak on Francis Ellen Watkins Harper. Thank you. Francis Ellen Watkins Harper was an abolitionist and poet born free in 1825 in Baltimore, Maryland. Francis's parents died before she was three years old and she was raised by her uncle, an outspoken abolitionist and teacher who established the Academy for Negro Youth. She attended this academy until she was 13 years old as children were typically expected to join the workforce at this age. The rigorous education she received along with the political activism of her uncle affected and influenced her poetry. She used any free time from work to read and write. Francis's first poems were published in abolitionist periodicals such as Fre Fre Frederick Douglass's paper. In 1845, Francis's first book of poems was published. In the early 1850s, Francis left Baltimore in order to teach. During this time, she lived in an underground railroad station where she witnessed the workings of the underground railroad and the movement of slaves toward freedom. This experience had a profound effect on Francis, her poetry, and her later work as an activist. In 1854, Frances was exiled from Maryland, where she was born, because of new slavery laws stating that Black people who came in through the northern border of Maryland could be sold into slavery. This marked the beginning of Frances's activism. She be began giving anti-slavery speeches through the northern United States and Canada as a representative of the Maine Anti-Slavery Society. In addition to her rigorous lecturing schedule, Frances was also working on a second book of poems entitled Poems on Miscellaneous Subjects, published in 1854. Her most notable work, Bury Me in a Free Land, is featured in this collection of poems, and we will end this presentation with a reading of it. Frances's marriage to Fenton Francis in 1860 slowed down her lecturing schedule and the birth of their daughter, Mary, in 1862 temporarily put a hold on her oratory career. With the end of the Civil War and the de death of her husband in 1863, Frances began touring again, giving lectures and publishing poetry in various anti-slavery publications. Frances formed alliances with strong figures in the feminist movement, including Susan B. Anthony. In 1866, Frances gave a moving speech before the National Women's Rights Convention in New York, demanding equal rights for all, including black women. Her famous speech entitled, We Are All Bound Up Together, urged her fellow attendees to include African-American women in their fight for suffrage. She emphasized that black women were facing the double burden of racism and sexism. Therefore, the fight for women's suffrage must, must include suffrage for African Americans. This speech had repercussions throughout the women's suffrage movement. Francis's commitment to equal rights caused her to reject the racist comments of fellow suffragists Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who did not support the 15th Amendment's aim of enfranchising black men without extending the right of suffrage to women. The result was to split the organization. 
Frances also published books throughout this period, including her well-known novel, Iola Leroy, one of the first novels published by a black woman in the United States. This stirring, stirring novel tells the story of the young daughter of a wealthy Mississippi planner who travels to the North to attend school only to be sold into slavery in the South when it is discovered that she has Negro blood. Four years later, she co-founded co the National Association of Colored Women with Ida Wells Barnett, Harriet Tubman, and several others. Suffrage was an important goal for these black female reformers. Unlike predominantly white suffrage organizations, however, the NACW advocated for a wide range of reforms forms to improve life for African Americans. By the turn of the century, Frances began to scale down her activities and she died of heart failure in 1911 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She was buried next to her daughter, Mary, at Eden Cemetery. I'd now like to introduce Melissa Humphrey to tell us about Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. The original research for this section was done by league member Lee Mondale. Thank you. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin was a suffragist, fought slavery, and recruited African American soldiers to fight for the North in the Civil War. She was a great organizer and is best known for her central role in starting and sustaining clubs for African American women. She was born in 1842 in Boston. Her mother was a white English woman. Her father, who founded the Boston Zion Church, was from the island of Martinique. They sent Josephine to be educated in Salem, Massachusetts, where the schools were integrated. Josephine married George Lewis Ruffin at the age of 15. He was the first African American to graduate from Harvard Law School. He later served on the Boston City Council, the state legislature, and became the first black municipal judge in Boston. So Josephine witnessed firsthand the powerful people in Boston and the state of Massachusetts. With her husband, Josephine became active in the struggle against slavery. During the Civil War, they helped recruit black soldiers for the Union Army's 54th and 55th Massachusetts regiments. The couple also worked for the Sanitation Commission, which provided aid for the care of soldiers in the field. After the war, Josephine turned her attention to organizing for the Relief Association, collecting money and clothes to send to Southern Blacks resettling in Kansas, known as the Exodusters. Josephine supported women's suffrage and worked closely with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. In 1869, she joined with Julia Ward Howe and Lucy Stone to form the American Woman Suffrage Association in Boston. Some of these women, including Howe and Stone, founded the New England Women's Club. Josephine was its first black member when she joined in the mid 1890s. Josephine also wrote for the black weekly paper, The uh, Current, and became a member of the New England Women's Press Association. When her husband died in 1886 at the age of 52, Josephine used her financial security and organizational abilities to start the woman's era the country's first newspaper published by and for African-American women. It promoted interracial activities, but also called upon black women to demand more rights. Josephine served as the editor and publisher of the paper for seven years. With the help of her daughter, Florida Ridley and Maria Baldwin, a Boston school principal, Josephine organized and funded the Women's Era Club in Boston in 1894. It was an advocacy group for black women. This was a biracial women's club. There were 113 founding members. Josephine served as the president until 1903. The club's motto was make the world better, which were also the last words of Lucy Stone. The purpose of the club was to do charity work and, women's, and promote personal improvement and philanthropy. Topics discussed included lynching, and women suffered. Josephine wanted the club to help with racial uplift, urban progressivism, and the crusade for the rights of women. Josephine represented the club as a delegate to the fifth biennial convention of the General Federation of Women's Clubs. 
the president of the larger group hadn't realized that Josephine's club had black members. So they were not admitted. Um, the ensuing controversy became known nationally as the Ruffin Incident. In 1901, the club moved its headquarters to the Tremont Temple in Boston. The club disbanded in 1903. Josephine remained active in the struggle for equal rights and in 1910 helped form and become a charter member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. With other women from the New Era Club, she co-founded the League of Women for Community Service, which still exists today. She had four children. She died in 1924 and is buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. In 1995, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Her home on Charles Street is a site on the Boston Women's Heritage Trail. The newest addition to the State House Art Collection created in 1999 is Sheila de Bretville's and Susan Sellers' piece, Hear Us. This work honors all Massachusetts women who were active in public life by recognizing the contributions of six, one of whom is Josephine. The others are Dorothea Dix, Lucy Stone, Sarah Parker Ramond from Salem, Mary Kenny O'Sullivan, and Florence Luscombe. The work is a series of six tall marble panels, each with a bronze bust of the suffragists. Two quotations from each of the women are etched on their marble panel, and the wall behind all the panels has wallpaper made of six government documents repeated over and over with each document being related to a cause of one or more of the women. Now, Catherine Redmond will tell us about Ida B. Wells. Thank you. Ida B. Wells, she was a suffragist, civil rights activist, anti-lynching journalist, author, teacher, mother and wife. She was born into slavery in Mississippi in 1862 and orphaned at age 16 when she became the head of her household and she worked as a teacher to support her five remaining siblings. During this time, an event for which she is well known and which represents her activism's, activism for civil rights is remembered as the 1884 train incident. Ida, a young woman of only 21 years and only five feet tall, had daringly bought a first class ticket on a train bound from Memphis to Woodstock, Tennessee. When she settled in her seat, she was ordered by the conductor to move to the crowded smoking section in another car for black riders. She refused and was violently ejected from the train by the conductor and two white passengers. She was irate at the injustice and sued the railroad. Eventually, she won the case, which attracted a lot of media attention, and was awarded $500 in damages. Her victory did not stand, however, as eventually, and probably inevitably, the decision was reversed by Tennessee's Supreme Court. She then moved to Memphis and turned to journalism. A seminal moment in her life occurred shortly thereafter, when in 1892, three young men, all close friends of hers, were lynched and brutally murdered by a mob. The murder of her friends was in retaliation for the success of the grocery business, which was an economic threat to a white grocer across the street. The injustice and horror of the event marked the start of her lifelong passionate anti-lynching crusade for which she is so well known. For several years, she traveled around the states and overseas lecturing on the injustice of lynchings in the South. She frequently received threats of torture and death for her writing and speaking, but she persevered. She wrote, I felt that one had better die fighting against injustice than to die like a dog or rat in a trap. She returned from her travels later in the 1890s, settled in Chicago, and married the newspaper editor, Ferdinand Barnett. She raised her family of four children while continuing her work for civil rights and the women's movement. 
Because she was outspoken, she encountered disapproval from others. For example, in 1909, she was a founding member of the NAACP, but later she was ousted for being too radical. Also, white suffragists did not want their efforts to be diluted by Ida's anti-lynching crusade and tried to ostracize her from their movement. During this time, she was active in the National Women's Club movement. And among her many contributions, she organized the Women's Era Club, a civic club for African-American women in Chicago, which was later renamed the Ida B. Wells Club in her honor. She was also a founder of the Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago, formed to support black women interested in how they could use the power of the vote to protect their people from oppression, lynching, and racial terror. Ida Wells was no stranger to racism in the suffrage movement. For example, she attended the 1913 women's suffrage procession on the, we, on the eve of Woodrow Wilson's inaugural parade as part of the Illinois delegation. She was the only African-American in the delegation. And as the march was about to start, she was informed that blacks had been delegated to the back of the parade and she could not join her group. She was forced to leave the procession. But instead of joining the back, she waited on the street until the parade reached where she stood and then she, with two white colleagues, walked in the front of the Illinois delegation and led it down the avenue. This is remembered fondly by the words, you can't spell formidable without Ida. Ida Bell was honored for her remarkable life in many ways after her death in 1931, but to give just a few examples, in 1990, the US Postal Service issued a 25%, a 25 cent stamp in her honor. In May of 2020, she was awarded the posthumous Pulitzer Prize for courageous reporting on the horrific and vicious violence against African Americans during the era of lynching. And in June of 2020, during George, the George Floyd protests in Tennessee, crowds occupied the era area outside the Tennessee State Capitol, redubbing it Ida B. Wells Plaza. Also in the summer of 2020, a huge photo mosaic portrait of Ida Wells was installed in the floor of Union Station in Washington, DC. The portrait was made using thousands of smaller photos of women suffragists. It honored both Ida Wells and also the throng of other women activists depicted in the mosaic. She was quite a woman. Now Shari Pressman will talk about Mary Church Terrell. Thank you, Catherine. Born in 1863 in Memphis, the same year as the Emancipation Proclamation, Mary Church Terrell was part of the rising black middle and upper class who used their position to fight racial discrimination. Mary was the daughter of wealthy former slaves who wanted her to be educated. When she was seven, because Memphis schools were not adequate, Mary's parents sent her away to school in Ohio, where she stayed, graduating from Oberlin College with a bachelor's degree in classics in 1884, fluent in French, German, and Italian, and her master's degree in education in 1888 one of only two African-American women to do so. She taught at the well-respected M Street School in Washington, DC, the first African-American public high school in the country where she met her future husband, Robert Terrell. After two years in Europe, Mary returned to the M Street School, convinced that returning to her country to promote the welfare of her race was her duty. She and Robert Terrell were married in 1891. She was required to stop teaching because she was married. They had one daughter, Phyllis, born in 1898. Mary's life work would focus on racial uplift, the belief that Blacks would help end racial discrimination by advancing themselves through education, work, and community activism. Pointed as the first African-American woman to serve on the Washington, D.C. Board of Education, 
He championed equal education for the city's black students and gave voice to children who'd never been represented before. Mary had been a suffragist since her college days, continued to be active, though not allowed to be a member in the National American Woman Suffrage Association, NAWSA, and became acquainted around 1893 with Susan B. Anthony. In her autobiography, A Colored Woman in a White World, Mary describes her friendship with Susan B. Anthony as delightful and helpful. They remained friends until Anthony's death in 1906. The granddaughter of a white man and a black and Native American woman, Mary understood since college that her mobility as a white passing African American woman was perhaps necessary to move between black and white American groups. She allied with white women when it suited her aims for her own people. She traveled in circles where she was the only woman of color. Mary was one of the few African-American women allowed to attend the NAWSA meetings. Mary Church Terrell's cosmopolitan upbringing and belief that she was equal to anyone had been instilled in her at an early age. She was a self-described dignified agitator. Over a 12 year period, Mary was involved with 29 clubs working for the same purposes. Starting small, the women banded together in Washington and then linked African-American groups all over the country to form in 1896, the National Association of Colored Women. Her words, lifting as we climb, became the organization's motto and she became the organization's first president. Explaining the reasoning for establishing the National Association for Colored Women, Mary said, colored women, quote, created their own political organization, not because we're narrow and wish to lay special status upon the color of the skin, but because our status in this country seems to demand that we stand by ourselves. In 1898, Mary was invited to speak at the NAWSA biennial session in Washington. The address was a lengthy, eloquent call to action for NAWSA to fight for the lives of Black women. Referring to Frederick Douglass's thoughts, Mary stated that, quote, if judged by the depths from which they have come, rather than by the heights to which those blessed with centuries of opportunities have attained, Colored women need not hang their heads in shame. The speech received great reception from NAWSA and black news outlets, leading Mary to be invited back as an unofficial black ambassador for the association. However, black women were still not allowed to join or to create their own chapter within the organization. The International Women's Suffrage Alliance was founded to secure the enfranchisement of women of all nations. It was to this organization that Mary was invited to speak in 1904 in Berlin. Delegates were curious about the Negro woman from the United States. Hearing complaints from the German hosts that the American and British delegates were planning on speaking only in English, Mary decided on the spot to give her carefully prepared English remarks in German. She worried about having the time to adequately adapt her remarks, but she was encouraged by Ida Husted Harper covering the conference for the Washington Post. Mary's motive was to give German women the opportunity <clears throat> to hear firsthand from a woman with just one generation removed from slavery about the position of African-American women in the United States. She said about her remarks that she quote, represented not only the colored women of my own country, but since I was the only woman taking part in the International Congress who had a drop of African blood in her veins, I represent the whole continent of Africa as well. While most of the initiatives came from within the African-American community, she said, noted encouragement for what she called their more fortunate sisters of the dominant race singling out Susan B. Anthony, present at the conference and by then 84 years old. Mary called Susan B. Anthony the veritable Abraham Lincoln of women's emancipation. 
Mary received tumultuous applause from the audience. In 1909, Mary was invited to become a charter member of the newly formed National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Alice Paul and the National American Woman Suffrage Association held the 5,000 person march in Washington, D.C. suffrage parade. Um, in 1913, African-American women were not included or listed in the official program. After much debate among African-American women and within the National Association of Colored Women, Mary marched with the 22 young founders of the newly formed Delta Sigma Theta sorority at Howard University. Segregated at the back of the parade by the white organizers. Following the passage of the 19th Amendment seven years later, Mary focused on broader civil rights. In 1950, in her mid-80s, she started what would be a successful fight to integrate eating places in Washington, DC. In 1949, Mary and some colleagues entered the segregated Thompson restaurant. When refused service, they filed a lawsuit. In the three years pending a decision, Mary's tactics included boycotts, picketing, and sit-ins. On June 8, 1953, the Supreme Court ruled in a unanimous decision in District of Columbia versus John R. Thompson Company that segregated eating places in Washington, D.C. were unconstitutional. Mary Church Carroll lived to see Brown versus Board of Education, the landmark 1954 Supreme Court decision that held to be unconstitutional the racial segregation of public schools. She died shortly after at the age of 90. I'd like to introduce Kathy Marie Michael, who will talk about Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer, born in Mississippi in 1917 into Jim Crow South, was the granddaughter of enslaved black people. As the youngest of 20 children in a family of sharecroppers, she was forced to leave school during the sixth grade to help on the plantation. At the age of eight in 1925, she witnessed an event that would later inspire her into activism, the lynching of a local sharecropper who had dared to speak up for himself when local whites refused to pay him for his work. His lynching revealed the stringent conditions of the Jim Crow South. Her eyes were open to a country where black people were expected to be subordinate to whites and transgressions could result in devastating consequences. At the age of 44, in 1962, Hamer learned from, Hamer learned from the voting rights organizers at SNCC, she had the right to vote. Up until that time, nobody had told her she could vote. Voter suppression in the Jim Crow South was pervasive. With a SNCC, she traveled tw 26 miles in a rented bus with 17 others to register. They were subjected to literacy tests that involved reading and interpreting a section of the state constitution. When, ha when Hamer arrived home later that evening, the white owner of the plantation gave her an ultimatum. Quote, if you don't withdraw your registration, you will have to leave, unquote. And Fanny chose to leave. Several days later, white supremacists sprayed 16 bullets into the home where Hamer had been staying. Hamer knew the bullets were meant for her, yet she was undeterred. By June, 1963, Hamer had become a member of SNCC and was traveling and speaking about voting rights throughout the country. On one of those trips, a rest stop became one of the most harrowing experiences of Hamer's life. She and her friends were violently thrown into police cars, taken to the Winona jailhouse, interrogated for hours, thrown into cells, and beaten relentlessly. Quote, she said, they beat me till my body was hard, till I couldn't bend my fingers or get up when they told me to. That's how I got this blood clot in my left eye. 
The sight's nearly gone now. And my kidney was injured from the blows that gave me to my back, unquote. Yet Hamer could not be thrown off her mission. She recounted her experience in Winona on numerous occasions, most notably at the 1964 Democratic National Convention. In her televised DNC speech, Hamer called out American hypocrisy. She asked, quote, is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily? because we want to live as decent human beings in America, unquote. With her indomitable spirit and relentless commitment to uplifting black lives, she ran for public office three times. Hamer had pulled back the curtain. The United States could not claim to be a democracy while withholding voting rights from millions of its citizens. Hamer's passionate speeches set in motion a series of events that led to the 1965 passage of the landmark Voting Rights Act, the VRA. I'd like to read the quote by Eleanor Holmes Norton up in the upper right-hand corner of the poster. Those who heard her cannot doubt that as a speaker with an awesome combination of focused intelligence and vision, she alone was in a class with Martin Luther King. Junior. And it's been said that if she were not a woman, she could be as famous as him. Her address, combined with the nationwide protests led by Black activists, compelled President Lyndon B. Johnson to introduce federal legislation that banned local laws like literacy tests that blocked African Americans from the ballot box. The act also put in place, though recently curtailed, restrictions on how certain states could implement new election laws. Regrettably, these restrictions have been diluted in the 2013 Supreme Court decision. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 significantly bolstered black political participation in the South. In Mississippi alone, the number of African Americans registered to vote increased from 28,000 to 280,000 following its passage a tenfold increase. I lift my arms to Fannie Lou Hamer. May we all be blessed with some of her passion, grace, and tenacity. Uh, Kathy Leonardson will now tell us about Zitkala Sa. Zitkala Sa, also known as Gertrude Simmons Bonin. Her name Zitkala Sa means red bird. She was born in 1876 on the Yankton Lakota Reservation in South Dakota. Her father was a German American. He abandoned the family while she was very young. When she was eight years old, missionaries came and recruited ch children to take away for education to the Wabash, Indiana, a Quaker school that taught speaking, reading, and writing in English. She begged her mother to go and she was given the name Gertrude Simmons. She loved learning to read and write in English, but the school also stripped away her native heritage, prohibiting using native language and culture. In later writing, she describes the cutting of her long hair as a moment when her soul died. After three years at the school, she returned home to live with her mother on the reservation, but she found she no longer fully belonged in her own tradition and at age 15, she left again for White's Indiana Manual Labor Institute. She graduated, gave a highly acclaimed speech on the inequality of women's rights and began teaching piano and violin. She attended Earlham College and continued her violin studies at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. In 1910, in collaboration with a Brigham Young professor and composer, she wrote the libretto and songs for the Sundance Opera based on a Sioux ritual. It premiered in 1913 to high acclaim, but notably when it eventually opened on Broadway, her name was dropped and the professors was listed. Her early period of writing included autobiographical accounts of her experiences on the reservation and attending manual labor schools plus her collections of Native American stories and legends, 
in articles for the Atlantic Monthly and Harper's. This was a time of recounting and remembering her heritage. Her second period of writing began in 1916 and was a time of activism. In 1916, she and her husband, Captain Raymond Bonin, who was one quarter Yankton Dakota ancestry, moved to Washington, DC. She and her husband founded the National Council of American Indians. She joined the Society of American Indians and from 1918 to 1919, served as editor of the American Indian Magazine. One of her most effective political writings of 1923 called Oklahoma's Poor Rich Indians exposed the robbery and murder of the Osage people to obtain their oil leasing fees. A recent book called Killers of the Flower Moon told this story. Her article influenced Congress to pass the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, which returned some of the lands previously taken from the tribes and encouraged tribal self-government. Sitkala saw called for recognition of Native American culture, along with citizenship rights, as a mean to, to gain access to political power. Some of her writings were designed to preserve Native American traditions and stories. Her political writing countered the narrative that Native Americans readily assimilate into America's dominant Christian culture with no harm done to them. It is notable that Native Americans did not become American citizens until 1924, the, um, the Indian Citizen Act, but voting was still left up to the states in which they resided and Native Americans were subject to similar barriers to voting as Blacks. Many political leaders thought they should be assimilated into mainstream culture before they were enfranchised. They, they did not fully gain their right until 1948. Zitkala Sa was the most influential Native American activist of the 20th century. When the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, she reminded white women that the fight was not over. She said, the, American, the Indian women rejoice with you, but urged them to remember their native sisters, many of whom lacked the right to vote and were not even citizens, thus without a political voice. Zakala Sa is buried in the Arlington Cemetery. Hers was a life of struggle, activism, and heart. Kathy Marie Michael will now offer some concluding remarks. Thank you. We have come to love and admire these women and their many colleagues. Unfortunately, as we've all witnessed, earning the right to vote has been a never ending struggle. Throughout history, progress was met with a backlash, or more appropriately called a white lash, which set us back each time. Currently, right now in 2020, we face an extraordinary white lash to the affirmation of the black voice. Yet the brilliant, beautiful, persistent organizational efforts of black people, especially black women, have met the challenge over and over again. In their loving tenacity and beloved community building, my hope has reblossomed. Kathy Hempel will now close our presentation with a poem by Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Bury me in a free land. Make me a grave wherever you will, in a lowly plain or a lofty hill, Make it among earth's humblest graves, but not in a land where men are slaves. I could not rest if around my grave I heard the steps of a trembling slave. His shadow above my silent tomb would make it a place of fearful gloom. I could not rest if I heard the tread of a cockle gang to the shambles led, and the mother's, mother's shriek of wild despair rise like a curse on the trembling air. I could not sleep if I saw the lash drinking her blood at each fearful gash. And I saw her babes torn from her breast like trembling doves from their parent nest. I'd shudder and start if I heard the bay of bloodhounds seizing their human prey. And I heard the captive plead in vain as they bound afresh his galling chain. 
if I saw young girls from their mother's arms bartered and sold for their youthful charms, my eye would flash with a mournful flame, my death pale cheek grow red with shame. I would sleep, dear friends, where bloated might can rob no man of his dearest right. My rest shall be calm in any grave when none can call his brother a slave. I ask no monument, proud and high, to arrest the gaze of the passers-by. All that my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slaves. <laughs>